Hi, welcome to the show. I'm Marty Otanias. This is Getting High on Anthropology, a story-based approach to cannabis research, education, and funding. On today's episode, we have Michael Kilman, a professional filmmaker and an instructor at the University of Colorado Denver Anthropology Department. Welcome to the show, Michael. Thanks. So um, I wanted to have you in to talk about your creative work using video and you have a new series that you started mm -hmm. and I was hoping you can tell us about the series and then why did you start it in the first place? Yeah, so, um, so the series is called Anthropology in 10 Minutes or Less uh, or just for uh, shorter for 10 and less. Uh, and uh, the series is basically trying to give people a taste of anthropology in less than 10 minutes. And it's a YouTube-based series, it's a web series, so it's more accessible to the general public. Uh, you know, you can watch it on your phone or, you know, uh, on a tablet or anything like that. Um, so uh, the whole idea is to basically make concepts and ideas in anthropology more accessible. That, that's the, the main goal. Um, I started this, quite honestly, uh, because Trump won the election. <laughs> so I had the idea kicking around in my head for a while, uh, and I had written down some, you know, scribbled down some ideas here and there. Um, but, uh, you know, after, um, you know, that, uh, you know, pretty terrible election outcome, uh, you know, I realized that uh, more than ever we need uh, kind of public engagement in, in the social sciences because, you know, people accept things like, you know, physics and, you know, gravity and, and you know, those things. But when it comes to social science, they tend to question them and they think we're just, you know, making things up, you know, just pulling them out of the air and we're just full of shit kind of. Kind of, so uh, I, I wanted to create a platform that was quick, accessible, and easy uh, for people to watch, and at least semi-entertaining. I mean, you get a lot of bad jokes on my show, so, um, uh, so that they could understand that we're not just making this up. This isn't some just crazy liberal agenda. We actually have reasons for the way that we approach different topics. Oh, so cool, and I think, um, again, why you're here with your knowledge of video production as a vehicle to sort of share information. I was hoping as we get into the conversation to ask for advice for people who are focusing on cannabis and they wanted to get started from scratch, like what would be a couple things to, to think about along technical lines and aesthetic mm -hmm. lines. But first, you know, what's your background? Did you just say, oh, I want to start a show and you got a phone and start to film it? Like, do you have any experience or like, give me a little bit about your educational background. So uh, actually, uh, in terms of video or anthropology? A little bit both. of both, because okay. they're blended together in your show. Yeah, yeah, so so my, first of all, uh, I have a, a video production background. I've been doing it for uh, 13, going on 13 years now. Um, I actually have no formal education in video production, or at least I did it before I went to graduate school for anthropology. Um, but uh, I basically, um, uh, an uncle of mine started a video production company and needed help. And so I basically started by filling DVD mailers. And then he's like, oh, I need this audio edited. Here's how you do it real quick. And then over the course of about a year, he trained me in how to do all the various different techniques. Uh, and then uh, after that, I, I ultimately went back to school for anthropology. Uh, got my bachelor's in anthropology, and then went on to get my master's in anthropology out of Portland State University. Do you mind if I stop you there? Sure. sure so sure. for the lay person at home watching this, what is anthropology? Because when I bring it up, people tell me about an excavation they were on in Egypt that they yeah. did. So yeah. how do you describe anthropology, just so for people get an idea about what it is? Okay, well, uh, obviously, first of all, anthropology is the study of the human experience. That's the simplest way to put it. And when you talk about excavations, you're talking about one of the four fields of anthropology, which is archaeology. Of course, there are three other fields. Uh, there's uh, sociocultural anthropology, which studies modern cultures and people's modern experiences. We have biological anthropology, uh, which looks at uh, both things like forensic anthropology uh, and also uh, our ancient ancestors, looking at fossil remains. Uh, and also things like paleopathology and studying disease and those kind of things. Uh, and then we have uh, linguistics, which uh, focuses on uh, how language uh, structures kind of the human experience and what are the commonalities, what are the differences of language, and how does that reflect the, the cultural sphere. And archaeology, which I already mentioned, which, you know, most people think of like Indiana Jones, of course, but, you know, in reality, it's mostly doing a lot of like surveying and excavation and data analysis of uh, material remains of humans. Basically, archaeology is studying the the material side of the human being. Okay, so. and I'm really glad you laid it out the way you did because 
um, you know, just to give people something tangible to grab onto in terms of our discipline. Mm -hmm. And so you and I are colleagues in the Department of Anthropology at UC Denver. You teach classes, and prior to coming to UC Denver, you were in a master's degree. Mm -hmm. And so for people who don't know about a master's degree, was it a requirement that you did a film, or what was the drive to do a film during your um, uh, time as a graduate student? So uh, it wasn't. Um, so I, it was one of those circumstances where my employment background kind of blended with my research interests. Uh, and I actually wasn't entirely sure what I was going to do for my master's thesis, and I um, uh, kind of happened upon a really interesting uh, theater troupe by the name of Romero Theater Troupe. Uh, and, you know, I, I'm kind of a firm believer that we shouldn't just go into a community and just kind of extract data and study them and then write papers on them. So I wanted to, to do something to kind of uh, give back to them. So in exchange for allowing me to do my master's research on what exactly they're doing, I offered to do some, you know, small-scale media stuff, some promotional stuff for them. Uh, and ultimately what it turned in was a full-length documentary. The documentary was not required. In fact, uh, the IRB was a little bit uh, difficult to get through because of the fact that it was a documentary film that was going to be viewed by the general public, so we had to do some extra steps to make sure our research was ethical. Um, uh, I believe, and don't quote me on this, but I'm pretty sure I was the first one to do a film component in that department. Now, other people had been doing film components, but I also had a written uh, research uh, paper as well, just uh, like the other uh, students. Okay, and I think it would be good to share with people for full disclosure, I met Michael several years ago, and you um, got shepherded to um, the Romero Troop, and you did the project, and I was on your committee for yeah. your thesis and, and reviewing your film. So make sure you share with us the name of the film and how could people uh, watch the film. So the, the name of the film is uh, Unbound, the story of the Romero Theater Troupe, uh, and it's free to watch on YouTube. Uh, the easiest way to find it is just to Google Unbound, the story of the Romero Theater Troupe, uh, and anyone can view it. So, Or if you do, uh, the Romero Theater Troupe also has a channel on YouTube that has a number of their performances, so if you're interested in looking at some of their kind of plays and the things they do aside of the documentary, uh, they're on there too. So. Poverty, homelessness, education, inequality. These issues and so many more seem overwhelming. Uh, most, most people just don't pay attention, uh, either because they think everything's hopeless. I mean, it's kind of driven into your heads that everything is hopeless. There's nothing you can do. The powers are too great. Every human being faces oppression. For some, it's much deeper and much uh, more unimaginable than for others but everyone faces oppression and that seeps into us. It gets into our veins, it gets into our, into our organs and it begins to weigh us down. This is a story about a method for a new way of looking at these issues. This is a story about the Romero Theater Troupe. Oh, Yeah, with the, you turn on the mass media, and the first thing you're going to see in the morning is like, oh, the uh, the opening bill to Wall Street's about to open. And it's just, you just know right there that the mass media is for the rich. Man, I just think it gives it gives them a voice. It gives them a voice, and it um, Jim will let he'll let a he'll let anybody come in off the streets and join the troop. And I love that because he makes he makes people feel valuable. And for the community, I think the truth makes the community feel valuable with the issues that they go through every day that might not have a voice, you know what I'm saying? You come to this hotel for a nice getaway or a conference, I come to this hotel to work 12 to 15 hour shifts at minimum wage just to get by. You tell me to get to the back of the line so I can work legally, yet I've been waiting in a line that doesn't exist for 15 years. And so the theater troupe itself, the members, their performances are part of a larger context in which they are promoting 
uh, momentum that allows uh, for direct action, allow for demonstrations, allow for individual acts of resistance where people uh, assert themselves in their own workplace or in their own community. I'm here today because I don't, I don't believe that people should be making a profit off of, of prisoners. I'm here to support Imelda and her family, especially Tanya and Yolanda that I know from Arizona. An absolutely beautiful day to be marching for justice and respect for the people who perform a necessary function on this campus. Without the custodians, we wouldn't be able to teach, we wouldn't be able to learn, and uh, they have not been getting a fair shot with management, with AHEC, and that's what this march is all about. It's good for, for people to put their stories in, into action, so to speak, because, um, you know, it just kind of puts their pain right out there. If I had a choice on a Saturday night, like, what am I going to do? Read about the KKK? But if somebody presents it to me in the way that we present it, um, it gives us permission to kind of process that. And, and I think that that's where healing begins also. So as a community, we're able to see it, we're able to identify it, we're able to, you know, process it and then take from it what we need. And the message is spreading. One of our members just opened a new restaurant called the Cool Cozy Cafe, where they serve fish every day, but Friday. <laughs> <laughs> I, okay, even I know that Mother Jones has been dead for eight years. The dead love to text. <laughs> There's a wonderful atmosphere of uh, friendship and caring in, in that group that I've, I've never seen in any other group. Well, we didn't invent this. Um, people have been educated through theater forever. It, back to the ancient Greeks and way before then. And so it's in our DNA mm -hmm. to watch ourselves play ourselves and laugh and feel and cry and walk away thinking, I'm a different person. Whip out your fedora and Indiana Jones theme music, because today we're going to explore how to punch a Nazi and save ancient artifacts by putting them in museums. All right, so this is just an episode on archaeology. Hi, and welcome to another episode of Anthropology in 10 or Less, your basement-based source for anthropological inquiry. I'm Michael Kilman, and today we're going to do a brief introduction to archaeology. So you remember from episode one that archaeology is one of the four main fields of anthropology. Archaeologists specialize in studying material culture, which just means they like to study stuff. Tangible stuff, leftover stuff, thrown away stuff. And this stuff is called artifacts. An artifact is a portable item that at some point was made and used by people. Examples of artifacts are stone tools, pottery, ritual objects, and yes, even ancient computers. Sometimes leftover stuff is not so portable though, and in that case they're called features. Features are a part of a site or landscape that cannot be easily moved. Examples are fireplace, post holes, and storage pits. By looking at features, you get an idea of what kind of structures people were building. And structures are generally buildings of some sort, like houses or palaces, temples, pyramids, or statues. So besides punching Nazis while searching for the Holy Grail, one of the most popular aspects of archaeology is the way we get stuff. Digging. Because archaeologists dig, they're able to recover information that is embedded deep within a landscape. This gives archaeology the ability to recover information from way long ago. To give you an idea of the kind of time depth that archaeologists have access to, 
The oldest stone tools created by hominins, our ancient ancestors, come from deposits dated to about 3.3 million years ago. Regarding the start of your show, the creation of it, what was one or two of the things you had to do to get the show off the ground along technical lines? Like you're in the basement with an iPhone or like, like what do you got in terms <laughs> of like the infrastructure? Well, so I already have an infrastructure in place because I've been doing production for so long, so I already had some nice equipment. Uh, so really it was just a matter of turning my equipment on. Um, but for you know someone starting, um, you know the easiest thing to do is just and and you'll see the first episode is far less sophisticated than la later episodes. I I get a green screen and you know uh, that's one thing I didn't have. So the first the first episode is just you know, me sitting at a desk and filming against a blank wall. And uh, you know um, uh, it's nice to have something in the background, but some you know uh, if nothing else, a blank wall is something. So. Uh, you know, you can actually film with an iPhone fairly decently. The real issue, though, is not the visual, it's the audio. And that's the hard thing, uh, is because you, if you don't have good audio, people won't watch you. Uh, if you have bad video, it, like, it doesn't matter. People just want to be able to hear you properly. If someone wanted to do uh, something like this series, one thing I would recommend is at least having one other person in the room, maybe your girlfriend or your brother or just someone hanging around uh, to uh, monitor that stuff because it makes it a hell of a lot easier than when you have to go back and refilm the whole thing because you know, here the audio didn't work out right. So how do you go about finding a topic and then what's sort of the formula for each episode? For me, yeah. Well, um, I mean, uh, to be honest, some of it's a whim, but also, like, I also am on Quora a lot, which is a, a question forum where you can ask professionals uh, different topics, and then they'll answer them to try to, to to solve questions. So it's like a you know, it's trying to um, it allows you to kind of Google something, and then if you look on Quora, you can actually find experts, and and it'll list what their experience is and those kind of things. And the one thing I notice a lot, and this, it's why I focus so much in the beginning on my show, is that a lot of people are confused about the topic of race. And um, they just don't really understand. Uh, they don't understand the basic history. They don't understand that it had a starting point, that it wasn't something that just always existed. Um, they don't understand the implications of it in the modern world. And so a lot of the way I do episodes is I look at what is a really important topic to co cover. And so like my first episode on race was on skin color because how many people actually really know where skin color comes from? Why do we have different skin colors? You know, you know I, in a teaching at the University of Colorado, I ask this question every term and I'm lucky if one person in a class of 40 or 50 people knows the answer. And so the first, so a lot of times I pick topics, uh, specifically when there's things that there's there's a lot of confusion around, or I'll pick a topic to introduce it so I can have a con deeper conversations later. So like the next episode I have coming up is on an introduction to religion, right? So they can have con uh, have conversations about the the cultural relationships between violence and religion, or the cultural relationships between spirit possession and religion, and, and how do anthropologists view those things. So a lot of it is mostly selected by what is there a need to clarify. So really important, I mean, the topics you cover because of not only you know the lack of knowledge or just to get conversations going, but also the timeliness of some of these issues. Mm -hmm. And like you, my classes at UC Denver, when we talk about race or the counterpart like white privilege, mm -hmm. it brings up so much conversation and heated debate. Mm -hmm. So have you had a conversation with viewers? Like what would be one or two responses that you may have gotten about one or two of your episodes? Well, I posted one of, I posted some stuff of on, um, uh, not necessarily race, but cultural appropriation on Reddit. And you know, Reddit is a hit or miss kind of thing, right? So you're gonna get people who are just like, this sucks and you know, name calling and that kind of stuff. And you'll have other people who wanna have real conversations about this and they may not always necessarily agree with my particular viewpoint. Uh, and, and so it can be kind of tough and challenging. I would say though, so far with, you know, the, the critiques or the comments have been mostly dismissive, as in, I don't like this because it challenges my viewpoint. I haven't really had like a meaningful conversation with 
a viewer at this point. I'd love to. I absolutely welcome that. Um, but um, I think one of the things I really try to make sure I do is fact check the crap out of everything I'm doing because I don't want it to go up on YouTube when I've got false information. Um, uh, and there was one bit of false information that I had, and this was particularly about uh, the origin of the, the, um, uh, the concept of redskins, or, or, or I'm not, sorry, it was uh, about the, um, uh, the practice of scalping. And I had made a claim on the, the channel, and I, I thought I, w I was, had fact-checked it, um, but I, I did have an archaeologist email me and say, hey, because I, I said on the show that, oh, Europeans did uh, started the scalping practice. Native Americans didn't do this traditionally. And I had an archaeologist contact me, and he said, actually, I just got off of a site that shows about 400 years before Europeans got here, there was some evidence of scalping. Oh, wow. And so what was cool, though, about that is that one critique and he was kind enough to email me rather than just like, you're wrong, you know, on YouTube. Uh, the good thing was is I was just able to, to snip that out of the YouTube uh, channel without much difficulty. Uh, because, you know, if there is legitimate facts that I'm getting wrong, I want to know about it, right? Yeah, I, I think what I really value about um, what you said is, you know, the academic in you, you did the groundwork, you checked a couple facts, triangulated all the information, because I think nowadays in the time that we're in, people can be so dismissive, <laughs> no matter if you have a whole stack of published, you know, yeah. peer-reviewed material. Yeah, yeah. So what about dissemination? Because I know a good, you know, stellar uh, a media maker has a robust dissemination plan. So are you just sort of sending the stuff to your friends, your family? Like, how do you get the stuff out there? Um, it, that's, a, that's a tough one, especially with YouTube, um, because YouTube really plays a lot to who can get the most views. And so that's, so part of the game is trying to get yourself enough views that you come up on the first page of search, and that's a challenge. So, um, but uh, one of the things that I've done is I went to um, LinkedIn groups, I went to face it, Facebook groups, uh, Reddit, Twitter, any place that has discussions of anthropology, and I kind of post things there and open up for discussions, and I also try to engage people and say, look, are, are there other topics you think are really pressing and tell me why and then maybe we'll cover those too. And so I think starting a conversation with your viewers or at least attempting to is important. Uh, it doesn't always work. Um, but I mean social media is, I mean I, to promote the show I spend about half the time I do to promote the show as I do on working on each episode because th it's, it's so much work to keep uh, you know, uh, pushing it out there and those kind of things. And also, too, like um, I have other um, professor colleagues as well, and they actually are now using some of my episodes in their classrooms, which is kind of nice. Um, uh, so, so other people are seeing it that way. Uh, when I went to an anthropology conference in March, I handed out flyers talking about it, and I just basically, every time I go out anywhere, I'm talking about the show, those kind of things. So uh, it's, it's tough, though. I mean, I think the, the, I have one episode that has about 3,000 views, which you know, isn't very much. Um, but uh, it just takes time. Before the show, I asked you about one of your favorite episodes, and you mentioned one. So give us briefly one of your favorite episodes, and we'll run a little clip. So I really like the cultural appropriation episode. And one of the reasons is, is because I tried to go beyond what textbooks do on the topic of cultural appropriation. And regularly what you'll get is just like one bit of information. This is what cultural appropriation is. And so with this episode, I tried to establish you know, what's the difference between cultural borrowing, in other words, how do ideas go across cultures, and cultural appropriation, which is kind of an abusive thing. And so I tried to create some kind of criteria that demonstrated which one was which, and at what moments is it appropriate or inappropriate to, to take from other cultures. Let's take a look at the Florida Seminoles. Number one, is it disrespectful or demeaning? Well, in this particular case, the tribe that the team is representing doesn't generally think so. In fact, there's been an ongoing collaboration between the Seminole tribe and the Florida team since 1947. Some of the ways that the tribe uses the mascot is to recount the historical narratives about some of the tribe's more successful acts of resistance against the American government. So they kind of use it for an educational tool. 
To be fair, there are some individuals within the tribe that aren't so happy about this relationship, but in 2006 when the NCAA banned Native American mascots, the tribe itself passed a resolution within their own government to support the school's mascot that ultimately granted Florida State an exemption from the rule. Two, does it contribute to stereotypes? Well, unfortunately it could, but there's a large difference here between the Redskins who basically use Hollywood stereotypes to represent Native Americans and the Seminole team who actively consult on the tribe on what forms of dress and attire are to be used. And that does make a difference because there are 562 federally recognized tribes in this country and only a handful of them are the Plains Indians that we see in Hollywood. Number three, what about the power dynamic? Sure. There's definitely a power dynamic here, but despite the past power dynamic, the present collaboration between the university and the tribal government allows for both parties to be on more even grounds. And even though the tribe doesn't receive money from the college, the college does provide scholarships and other opportunities for tribal members. So I've been talking a lot about collaboration here. Why? Because everyone, every culture, every person has the right to represent themselves how they want to be represented. So if the Seminole tribe wants to take part in this representation, then that's cultural borrowing. The Redskins, on the other hand, they're essentially stealing elements of a culture and misrepresenting an entire group of people. The Redskins are contributing to the long-standing tradition of taking the rights of self-determination away from the Native American people. Native Americans have had to fight tooth and nail to survive colonization for the past 500 years, be it the brutal violence and enslavement brought on by the conquistadors, the Trail of Tears ordered by President Andrew Jackson, the horror of an entire generation of children taken by force from their families and forced into boarding schools, to the events like Wounded Knee and the Sand Creek massacres, or even the recent events up at Standing Rock. Native Americans have spent generations fighting to have their right to self-determination and taking away their right to represent themselves in the name of a national sports team can be often just another reminder of the long history of struggle that Native Americans still endure. In May of 2018, so about a year from now, where do you see yourself going with the show? I'm, so a lot of what I'm doing with the show right now is introductory topics. I'm hoping that eventually I can do like a segment maybe twice a month on current events in relation to anthropology. I'd also like to start featuring anthropologists and their research. I'd like to be able to travel around a little bit and, and do some, uh, you know, maybe field pieces, those kind of things. So, but for right now, the show is primarily about just getting the basics, the core concepts of the four fields of anthropology, which we could spend 10 years doing because there's so much stuff. But I, I've been, you know, I'm hoping by this time next year I'll have 40 or 50 episodes uh, up on YouTube. At, at the moment I have eight and I have nine and ten uh, in the pipeline. Um, and I'm hoping by the end of summer to at least reach, uh, you know, 2025. But I'm, I'm hoping that by this time next year I'll have 40 to 50 episodes up and I can start branching out into some more uh, kind of um, uh, in-depth kind of episodes that, um, kind of show what it's like to be an anthropologist and some of the, the difficulties they face and some of the, the amazing kind of research they're doing out in the field. Race is kind of like money. It's not exactly real, but has a lot of power to shape the world. But the truth is the only reason it has any value is because we all agree it does socially. Money's only little green strips of paper. Without humans giving them value, they might just be fancy decorations or a party favor. I mean, why don't we use seashells or tree leaves or paint chips. The same is true for race. Even though it's not real, it has an extraordinary amount of power to impact people's lives. 